One of the challenges to any social group is unity. Church history is no exception. Within early Christianity, there were clear divisions even within the New Testament church. One group declared, we belong to Paul. Another asserted, we stand with Apollos. Others rejected Paul and Apollos, preferring another option, we hold to Peter. Still others solemnly professed yet another allegiance, we follow Christ. Without doubt, the gospel centered in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The proclamation of the cross was paramount. The message was single, but the interpretations thereof proved to be quite numerous and equally contentious. One of the greatest challenges facing the early church, after survival, was the pressing need to arrive at consensus on the main issues of faith. This to avoid dissension and focus the mission of the church. Thus began a process, a complicated undertaking, lasting centuries, aimed at uniting the faithful for all time. This is the story of those efforts, the winners and the losers, the achievements and the failures in the monumental struggle for unity out of diversity in framing the Christian faith. Early Christianity was a cluster of competing religious insights, if you will. It's an illusion to suppose that there has been a clear, unbroken line of consensus from the beginning of the church in terms of doctrine, theology, and a whole lot of things. Heresies, I would submit, preceded orthodoxy. And Conflict preceded consensus. Now because of this diversity within the early church, which is evident even in the New Testament, but quite apart from that, from lots of other sources, there were several pressing concerns that assailed the early church, prompting an agenda aimed at clarifying the faith once delivered to the saints. For example, there's a number of Christian sects in places like Cyprus as late as the 4th century. Sources tell us there were Nicene, Ebionite, Marcionite, Valentinian, and Sabalian forms of Christianity. There's five different types of Christianity four, three, four hundred years after the time of Jesus in Cyprus, and that's just one example. I want to talk a little bit about some of those pressing concerns and then shift gears and move to how the church developed consensus. One of the early pressing concerns was Judaizing Christianity. Recall from a, the previous lecture that Judaism was one of the main religious approaches in the Near Eastern Mediterranean world of early Christianity. Judaizing Christianity, sometimes associated with James, the brother of Jesus. And the problem with Judaizing Christianity, which Paul tackles head on, particularly in his letter to the churches in the province of Galatia, present day Turkey, was this problem of adhering to the Old Testament law. If I could put it this way, there were Jews who became Christians who wanted to keep Christianity Jewish. This created a problem, because while Christianity was Jewish in its roots, it stopped being Jewish and became something distinctively different. Another problem was the Ebionites. Now, the Ebionites believed that Jesus was simply the human son of Mary and Joseph. Secondly, the Ebionites had a strong emphasis upon the binding character of the Mosaic Law. So in a sense, they were Judaizing Christians. They didn't like Paul. They rejected Paul. And they only used Matthew's Gospel. They didn't want to use Mark, Luke, John, or any of the other options that early Christians had. But a major challenge in the early church was the problem of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a 
strange and diverse collection of ideas. It was syncretistic. That is, a lot of things came together and were melded into a unified whole. Persian dualism, oriental mysteries from the east, Babylonian astrology, and of course, Hellenistic philosophy. This form of Christianity, they were Christians, I submit. The term Gnosticism probably can be challenged and, and likely should be in terms of it being an accurate designation, but I'll use it because it's so embedded in the literature. This form of Christianity arose from many sources and seems to have had its principal aim in the liberation of the spirit through Gnosis, hence Gnosticism. What in the world is Gnosis? Well, it's a Greek word. It's the Greek word for knowledge. But in this context, it's not about information. It's knowledge, rather, in terms of mystical illumination, which provides insight into the human condition, the human situation. Kind of this elevated, superior insight. In the early years, of the development of the church, there was a wide intersection of Gnosticism with Christianity. But there were notable exceptions. First of all, in terms of creation. In Gnostic thought, creation was the work of an inferior deity, an inferior God. Secondly, there were differences in terms of salvation. Because for Gnostics, salvation meant liberation from the flesh, from the body, and from all matter. Because flesh, body, and matter is bad. Hence, creation is bad. So God, the good God, certainly didn't make a bad creation. Therefore, there must be an inferior God who actually created the world and who imprisoned all souls within flesh. Obviously, Christianity does not teach Mainstream Christianity teach that it's liberation from, of our souls from the body. That's what's at issue. And another thing uh, I would mention as a difference is Christ himself. On the strength of my previous point about the negative opinions of the flesh and body and matter, Gnostics were docetous, coming from the Greek word to seem. And a lot of them held that Jesus really wasn't human. He just appeared to be human because flesh is bad. Why would God come and take on this evil uh, substance to live in? One of the early Gnostics was a man named Serinthus who flourished at the turn of the first century. There are early views that were actually held in early Christianity that the New Testament books of the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse of St. John, the Revelation, were written by Serinthus, a Jewish Christian Gnostic teacher who flourished in Asia Minor. We can actually find groups of Christians who believe that John didn't write them, but Serinthus did. There is some chance that in the Epistle of St. John, chapter 2, there's a veiled reference to Serinthus whom St. John the Apostle actually opposed at Ephesus. And that confrontation between John and Serinthus is recorded in early Christian literature by Irenaeus in his book Against Heresies. He was writing around the year 180. And he said, and I write, there are those also who heard from him, speaking of Polycarp, that John the disciple of the Lord going to bathe at Ephesus and perceiving that Serinthus was in the bathhouse, rushed out of the bathhouse without bathing, exclaiming, let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serinthus, the enemy of the truth, is inside. So according to Irenaeus and Polycarp, we know that John and Serinthus, well, almost met, at least. Serinthus evidently taught adoptionism. That is to say that Jesus was an ordinary man who was adopted by God to be the Son of God. He wasn't actually God in flesh. Now in general terms, Gnosticism taught that a demiurge, that is to say a lesser God, in distinction 
to the divine being existed and they also held to dualism, good and evil, light and darkness, sin and righteousness, dualism, Marx, Gnosticism. There never was a so-called Gnostic church or a Gnostic rule of faith. There was never a Gnostic Bible, so to speak. And so therefore there were never any limits imposed upon Gnosticism in terms of theological or doctrinal development within the Gnostic system. So we have in the second century the Gospel of Philip that states very clearly the one who has knowledge of the truth is free. Ignorance is a slave. Gospel of Philip. Hence the Delphic oracle slogan, Know Thyself, was very popular in Gnostic circles. The question we have to ask ourselves is this. Why did Gnosticism develop? Well, several answers, I think, to that query. First of all, paganism perceived Christianity as another element to absorb. The scandal of the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus, was an absolutely unacceptable feature to many people. Thirdly, it was perceived by some that Christianity was simply not sufficiently intellectually challenging enough. Whereas the esoteric mysteries and philosophies of Gnosticism were certainly challenging. And Gnosticism, I think, was attractive to many people because of that esoteric, mysterious nature. There's one Gnostic group called the Mandeans that have survived in southern Iraq to the present day. And before the war started, there were about 15,000 Mandians. These are Gnostics who precede Christians and have survived all of this time. But perhaps the most notable name of all is that of Marcion. Marcion lived from about the year 70 up until the year about 154, so he overlaps with some of the later apostles like John. Who was Marcion? Well, depending upon whose testimony you want to accept and which source you want to give the most credence to, Marcion was a seducer or a sailor, a hermit, a bishop, or Marcion was the secretary of St. John the Apostle, a follower of Simon Magus, who's referred to in the New Testament, or a student of the philosophers, a Gnostic, or according to some, a repentant heretic who in his old age wanted to return to the bosom of Holy Mother Church. Marcion, a man for all seasons and all occasions, it seems. Polycarp, who was a student of St. John the Apostle, met Marcion on the street one day, and Marcion said, Polycarp, do you know who I am? And Polycarp looked at him and said, Indeed I do. You are the firstborn of Satan. And crossed the street and walked away. Some have argued that Marcion was the only one in the second century who understood Paul, and he misunderstood him. Tertullian tells us that Marcion came from Pontus, which is an area in northern Turkey today, on the Black Sea. The son of a bishop, apparently, who was a ship owner. He departed from the faith. He came from the city of Sinop in Asia Minor on the Black Sea. He came to Rome around the year 140. His views were examined and rejected by a council in Rome in July in the year 144. He is one of the most influential heretics of the second century. Justin Martyr complains of Marcion in his writing First Apology, denouncing him as the apostle of demons, but conceding that the influence and the ideas of Marcion had spread completely across the Roman Empire that is, across the face of Christianity, as it were, by the year 150. Irenaeus, one of the church fathers, called the disciples of Marcion agents of Satan. Strong language, strong words. Marcion did found a church. No Gnostic had ever founded a church, but Marcion did. And he had his own creed, 
his own constitution and his own liturgical service, if you will. And in fact, the Marcionite church so closely resembled the mainstream Christian church that Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived in the fourth century, felt compelled to warn Christians not to enter a Marcionite church accidentally. What were his teachings? Marcion, I'm spending this much time on Marcion because he's symbolic of uh, so much of the diversity within early Christianity. He taught that Jesus was not fully human. He held that the God of the Old Testament was not the God of the New Testament for the same reasons that the Gnostics uh, articulated. He denied the resurrection. The essential message of Jesus was in fact the Sermon on the Mount. So it's the ethics, the morals of Jesus that attracted Marcion the most. He constructed his own Bible, Marcion did, and this was such an important issue that I will want to take it up again in a subsequent lecture when I talk about the formation of the Christian Bible. Marcion taught that Jesus came to liberate humankind entirely from the law and he loved Paul, Marcion did. He adhered to strict asceticism and celibacy, Marcion did. In effect, as the great German church historian Adolf von Harnack once argued, Marcion was rebelling against the legalizing of the pure gospel. And when he appeared before the synod in Rome in July 144, he was appearing before those presbyters, drawing a distinction between law and gospel and insisting that Roman Christianity of the second century was a Jewish type of Christianity and was therefore illegitimate. That's Harnack's summary. While Mar Marcion has sometimes been called a Gnostic, it's interesting to point out he never claimed any special knowledge. And to be a Gnostic, you were supposed to have the Gnosis, but he didn't claim it. So maybe he wasn't a Gnostic after all. However, Marcion was refuted by numerous Christian thinkers. And this demonstrates the attention that he received. It says something to us about the strength of his perceived threat to the church. And it wasn't just all perception. Bishop Theodoret in the 5th century claims to have converted eight Marcionite villages involving thousands of Marcionites. Marcion did encourage the study of scripture but he rejected completely all of the allegorical methods of interpreting scripture. He taught that the passion and the death of Jesus was the work of the creator God, therefore the bad God, because why would you have God in flesh and go through this crucifixion? This was the work of the creator God. Marcionite churches, as I've alluded to, were established all across Christendom in the second and third centuries in many parts of the Roman Empire. Origen, another great church father of the third century, comments about the physical churches of Marcion. And there is in fact evidence, clear evidence, in Arabic sources supporting the survival of Marcionite churches in eastern Iran well into the 11th century. This was no small threat, nothing that sprang up overnight and then was put down. Marcion left no extant writings because the church always wanted to get rid of things they didn't agree with, but large parts of his writings can be reconstructed from Tertullian's book entitled Against Marcion. Tertullian is the one, around 200, who tells us that Marcion later repented and was to be received back into the church, but alas, died before this could be transacted, and therefore he remained the Pontic heretic, the Pontic pest, in Tertullian's words, a wondrous monster. There were other movements of concern, other pressing issues of concern that prompted the church to come to this process of defining the faith. Another movement was known as Montanism. Montanism arose in Phrygia, which is in west-central Turkey, not terribly far from where Marcion originated. 
It's named after a chap by the name of Montanus, who after he was baptized in the second century, declared himself full of the Holy Ghost and began to prophesy on basis of this alleged possession. Two women are very famous in this context and accompanied him. Their names are Priscilla and Maximilla. They were considered prophetesses, female prophets, by the Montanus who followed them. But they were dismissed by church fathers like Hippolytus as wretched women. They adhered to a rigorous code of ethics, these Montanus did, and they protested and I have to say probably with some legitimation about the ease with which the church forgave sins and accepted backsliders and sinners into the church. Some later Montanus claimed that Montanus himself was the Holy Ghost. There was a strong emphasis upon new revelation in this Montanus circle and they preached apparently that the heavenly Jerusalem would descend to earth in Phrygia, of course. Late in life, Tertullian, whom I've mentioned several times, became a Montanist and taught Montanist doctrines. Montanus uh, had this rigorous code of ethics and Tertullian uh, adopted this severe critique of marriage. He was married. Tertullian was. Priscilla taught that virginity was advantageous for the reception of inspiration and revelation. They forbade flight in times of persecution and at times Christians were subjected to persecution and there were Christians who ran away to save their lives. When the persecution passed they came back to the church. The Montanists said this is nonsense. If you're going to run in the face of danger why should you come back and just be accepted into the church and your sins forgiven. They advocated a withdrawal from the world, fasting, severe, rigorous lifestyle. All three of them, Montanus, Priscilla, and Maximilla, spoke in the name of the Divine Spirit. One citation from Montanus himself. No angel, no messenger is here but I, the Lord, God the Father have come myself. I am the Lord God Almighty transformed into a man. That got the attention of the church. Maximila said, after me no other prophet will come, only the final end. Well, people believed this. There were groups of people who became Montanus, who followed the Montanus teachers. For example, a bishop of all things in Pontus, was tortured by visions of the end of the world. He prophesied that within two years the last judgment would occur. People sold their homes, quit their jobs, and went out and waited for the Lord to come. In Syria, another bishop led his entire church out of the town into the wilderness to meet Christ. They wandered around aimlessly for some time and would have died of hunger and thirst and exposure to the elements had not the civil authority after them and brought them back to town. Priscilla claimed that Christ had appeared to her in a dream as a female, revealing where he or she would return. The position of Priscilla and Maximilla demonstrated that even women were able to receive the Holy Spirit, a feature that was offensive to the Orthodox Church. And quite clearly the Montanists allowed a female clergy, as did some of the mainstream early churches, but this also became repugnant to the Orthodox. Well, these and other concerns prompted a clarification of doctrine. And I want to shift gears now from some of these groups and individuals and ideas to now examine how on a parallel track the church was attempting to define the faith established doctrine. And I start with a group of people called the apologists. Now, they weren't going around apologizing in the sense of saying I'm sorry for something, but they were giving an apology. The, the, the Latin word apologia is a legal speech 
for the defense delivered before a court. So, these so-called apologists are preparing a defense of the faith to their detractors, to their skeptics, and to those who were not entirely convinced. These were mainly intellectuals of the second century. Defenders of the faith, I think, is perhaps an appropriate term. They wrote to heads of state. They wrote to influential people, refuting the false charges against the new religion. Charges of cannibalism, of immorality, of treason. Charges, if you will, of atheism. Some of the best known of these apologists were Justin Martyr and Tertullian. And this group of men fought against the various heresies, as they were called. They placed stress upon the writings of the apostles, and they used the Hebrew Bible, that is the Old Testament, to explain the developing Christian movement. Several points, I think, distinguish the function of these apologists. They made the assumption that Christianity was a philosophy, that is, a set of answers. And they wanted to demonstrate the sinfulness and the foolishness of pagan religions and assert the superiority of the Christian faith. They began from the premise that Christians had legal rights. Now, in a sense, this was nonsense because Christianity had no legal rights, technically, until the fourth century. But these apologists argued, you know, we're good Roman citizens, we're law-abiding, we're good people, and we, have, and we should have legal rights. They considered the Greek mentality as a way of leading people to Christ. And I refer to that onslaught of Hellenism, which did, in fact, shape the church in very deep and lasting ways. And their task was to convince the authorities that Christianity was politically harmless and possessed moral and cultural superiority. So they wanted to have a reasoned defense of the faith once delivered to the saints that could be presented in a reasonable, philosophical, learned fashion. One of the main literary attacks upon Christianity was mounted by a man named Celsus in a book called True Discourse. The book has been lost. However, 90% of it is preserved in Origen's book Contra Celsum against Celsus. We know absolutely nothing of Celsus as a historical character. Celsus, in his book Attacking Christianity, praises the Logos doctrine and the moral code of Christians. He says, this is all good and right. However, he objected to the exclusive claims of the church. He was very critical of the miracle stories found in biblical history. The doctrines of the incarnation and the cross were repugnant to Celsus. He argued that Christian pacifism and their refusal to conform to the state, in fact, undermined the state. He also appealed to Christians to abandon their religious and political intolerance. Tertullian, writing around the year 200, raged against the heretics. Now, Tertullian was a North African Christian writer. In this context, he's well remembered for three points. His pithy but profound saying, the blood of the martyr is seed. The blood of the martyr is seed. Secondly, his question, what is there in common between Athens and Jerusalem? Or to put it another way, what relation is there between faith and reason? And his answer is none. None whatsoever. Which takes me to my third point that Tertullian and his defense of Christianity is noted for. He said that Christian truth, once it's discovered, means there is no reason to look any further. Truth has been given to the church once and for all. Just accept it. Curiosity, he argued, can only lead to error. Well, despite the not inconsiderable 
influence of the school of Alexandria in northern Egypt, a certain anti-intellectual tendency can be detected within early Christianity. Apart from the apologists, but an anti-intellectual tendency. I refer to Cyprian, another North African bishop of the third century, who taught outside the church there is no salvation. And Cyprian, of course, would define what that church was. And that saying, outside the church is no salvation, was passed down into ecclesiastical history and became a mainstay of the medieval church. Cyprian also said, one can no longer have God as father who has not the church as mother. You can see the same sort of thing, a big emphasis upon the developing institutional church. The push for pure doctrine and the urge to purge then became widespread, particularly in the second, third, and fourth centuries of Christendom, but there were, I have to tell you, exceptions to this urge to purge and this uh, push for pure doctrine. The Labada inscription from a Christian site about four miles southeast of Damascus has been dated quite reliably to either the year 318 or 319. It records the building, and I'm now citing from that inscription, of a synagogue of the Marcionites in the village of Labada in honor of the Lord and Holiness Jesus Christ built under the leadership of the presbyter Paulus. In Syria, in the fourth century, a church openly constructed a Marcionite church, it says on the sign, the first church of the Marcionites to the glory of Jesus. This demonstrates how the religious policy of Licinius, the Eastern Roman Emperor in the fourth century was very much in contrast to the policies of his uh, colleague Constantine in the West. There was a toleration of diversity, but I hasten to say that these islands of toleration for diversity became fewer and fewer and fewer as time went on. So that brings me now to the subject of constructing orthodoxy. We've got diversity and we've got an urge to eliminate it. Let us construct orthodoxy. Epiphanius, fourth century bishop of Cyprus, said, bad belief is worse than no belief at all. He went further and said, Heresies and their founders are the gates of hell. Strong language from a high-ranking churchman. He was a rabid opponent of all forms of thought outside the boundaries of orthodoxy. Philip Schaff, the great American church historian, writing over a hundred years ago, commented that Epiphanius was the patriarch of heresy hunters. The patriarch of heresy hunters, and there have been a lot of heresy hunters through the history of the church. Heresy then prompted the rise and establishment of orthodoxy, which is a big word which simply means correct teaching or the right teaching. Early Christians were saying, what are we to believe? What exactly is right? There's all of these ideas about God, about Jesus, about the books that we should be reading or not, about the ideas of salvation, you name it, there was diversity on practically every point. Well, there was a suspicion that tolerance and diversity undermined truth and undermined religious security. And religious security was very important to early Christians. Doctrinal development of ideas was essential inasmuch as there was no standard Christian Bible at this time. I'm talking 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries. There is no standard Christian Bible. And even if there had been, important teachings like the doctrine of the Trinity and the dual nature of Christ were nowhere in Scripture formally articulated in those writings. 
So even if you've got a Bible, it isn't sufficient to support the teachings of the church, not in itself. So there's a need to define the faith. And the leadership of the church took it upon itself to define what exactly is correct teaching, what is orthodox. This need to define the faith became more important as time went on. While the Christian church retained an active eschatological awareness, that is to say the expectation of the end of the world, the return of Jesus, the rapture of the church, most began to accept the delay of all of this. As time went by, it became pretty clear that the world wasn't going to end quite as quickly as some had thought. And hence, the proclamation of the gospel was in need of practical support. Now, in defense of heresy, I think it needs to be said that heresy was not designed by its authors to be disruptive. Rather, most heresies, as they came to be called, were, in my view at least, honest attempts at understanding and explaining the Christian faith. Sometimes heresy arose out of attempts to convert either Jews or pagans. So theology developed in many respects out of its confrontation with heresy. It is not too far off the mark, I think, to suggest that practically every plank in the church was laid as a result of heretical problems. Now there are several components in the task of establishing correct teaching. <clears throat> One is the canon of the New Testament, the establishing of the Christian Bible. Secondly, the rule of faith. Thirdly, creeds. Fourthly, councils. Fifth, the rise of the episcopate. And sixth, the idea of apostolic succession. Now, I want to talk about each of those because they're very important in establishing what church uh, teaching was the correct teaching. Now the matter of the New Testament is so important that a separate lecture will be devoted to it entirely. So I'm not going to say anything about the development of the Bible. I want to give a whole lecture subsequently on that. The rule of faith <clears throat> is a term first used by Irenaeus around the year 180. And it signifies the main points of Christian teaching and may be regarded, I think, as an antecedent to the early Christian creeds, the rule of faith, kind of an amorphous sort of thing. But what really solidifies this rule of faith is the establishment of creedal statements, some of which are used every week in Christian communities around the world, and they date from this early period of the history of the church. These are official statements of faith. There are three of them which are germane to early Christianity. The first one, the earliest one, is the Apostles' Creed. It's essentially a baptismal confession. Its contents date probably from the late second century. The theory initially was that the components of the Apostles' Creed was a summary of apostolic faith. Later, however, it was held that each of the twelve apostles had contributed one point. There's twelve points to the Apostles' Creed. Thus, we have a transition from a confession of faith to apostolic authorship. The second <coughs> creed that needs to be mentioned is the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed originated with the Council of Nicaea which sat in the year 325. But it was refined by the Council of Constantinople in 381, but it's known historically as the Nicene Creed. It was developed to refute a heresy, namely the heresy of the Arians. The third one is the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed dates from either the late 5th or the early 6th century and arose in response yet again to a heresy, to a doctrinal dispute, this time Nestorian controversy. 
The creed itself probably originated in Gaul, in present day France. The attribution to Saint Athanasius is unsound, and the creed is clearly not of fourth century origin. Unlike the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed is distinguished by its anathemas and declares very clearly that unless you believe the statements of faith in the Creed, you cannot be saved and that you will be lost eternally. Adherence to the Creed is necessary for salvation. Another step in this development of orthodoxy were the councils. Now, councils, these are essentially gatherings of clergy, mainly bishops, who congregated to confer with each other and to rule on matters of faith and doctrine and church discipline. The New Testament precedent comes from Acts 15, where there's a council at Jerusalem. And the people who congregated there made decisions affecting the life and teachings of the early church. Well, there's five types of councils. One is an ecumenical council that is involving the entire church as much as possible. A second type are patriarchal councils, mainly synods that met in Rome, in Antioch, Alexandria, Carthage, Jerusalem, and Constantinople, the main centers of early Christianity. A third type are provincial councils, twice yearly meetings of bishops within a province. A fourth type of council was the diocesan. A bishop of a city was supposed to gather his clergy together several times a year to discuss what was going on in the diocese, which is simply a name for a region, for a church district, if you will. And the final type of council is the endemic council. That means they're just permanent. They're there all the time, continually discussing the faith and articulating the rules. We know of one such endemic council in the city of Constantinople. Many of the doctrinal diversities centered on the person and the nature of Jesus. Ultimately, it fell to the councils to make rulings on such matters, especially the ecumenical councils. There was a number of ecumenical councils. Nicaea met in 325 to discuss Arius and the person of Christ. Council of Constantinople in 381 convened to discuss the natures of Christ. The Council of Ephesus in 431 met to discuss the humanity of Christ because of the threat of Nestorianism. And the same council met again in 449 for the same reason. And the last big one in this period was the Council of Chalcedon in 451 that talked about the divinity of Christ and ruled that Jesus was fully God. Well, rulings, as you might expect, did not necessarily eliminate diversity. The Nestorian church that the Council of Ephesus met in the year 431 to discuss persists to the present day in various places in the Middle East. Less than 100 miles separates the two cities of Nicaea and Chalcedon in modern Turkey. The time between those two councils, 126 years, I submit to you, is one of the most important periods in church history entirely in terms of the formation of doctrine. Several important steps along that 100 mile, 126 year route. Doctrine and theology became articulated, defined, and published. Heresies likewise were defined and repudiated. At Nicaea, the deity of Christ was decided upon. Constantinople in 381, the Holy Spirit, the deity of the Holy Spirit was defined. At Chalcedon in 451, that Christ is fully human and fully God at one and the same time. Now Nicaea was unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable prior to Emperor Constantine who legalized Christianity. At Nicaea, judgments were made. Everybody was expected to conform, and those who didn't were deprived. That brings me to the next step, the next component 
in the establishing of correct teaching, orthodoxy, and that is the rise of the bishops. The bishops, the term itself comes from the Greek word episkopos, which is a secular term. It's not a religious term at all, it's secular. In its historic context, it simply referred to a wide range of uh, civic functions and administrations. For example, the overseer of a slave, of slaves, was a bishop. A construction foreman was a bishop. Or the head of a mint. Now Christians took this term, meaning overseer, and gave it priestly connotations. The term bishop is doubtlessly derived from Hellenistic vocabulary. In its oldest sources, the term is almost always plural, and that's important. Chapter 15 of the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, a first century source, instructs the church to elect or appoint bishops and deacons. First Clement, a book written in the 90s of the first century, The Shepherd of Hermas, dating from around 130, and Justin Martyr around 150, give no indication of any central leadership in the church, and certainly not at Rome. They speak of plural leadership, overseers, presbyters, bishops. Bishops are not higher in terms of authority at this time in church history. They simply had a special duty, and that duty was to look after the poor. That was the duty of a bishop. Now the first witness to a single bishop at the head of a local church is found in the writings of Ignatius of Antioch in the early second century. Now the position is not described by Ignatius in priestly language. It is not based upon the idea of apostolic succession, not at least the way in which I read Ignatius. It's related to a congregation, not to a diocese. But throughout much of the second century, it's interesting to note that Roman Christianity, that is the, the church at Rome, was content with a presbyterial system. And it's significant that in the case of Marcion, recall that he appeared before a synod at Rome in the year 144, Hippolytus makes no mention of a bishop at all at that particular council or trial, if you will. I think that's pretty strong evidence to suggest that there wasn't a bishop in Rome. Ignatius instructs the church at Smyrna to do nothing without bishops. But this relates to order rather than to the validity of functions. For example, baptism and the Eucharist. The chief concern for Ignatius was with order. However, by the mid-second century, bishops as heads of each Christian community was generally observed. And this development, I think, can be put down to several factors. One, there is a natural tendency towards a single head. And first among equals emerges in a lot of, if not most, human situations. Secondly, we must not rule out the influence of the Roman monarchical system, which was a hierarchy going up to the head of state, and Christians took that over. Single leadership facilitated many administrative functions better, more easily, and more expeditiously. The need for authoritative teaching prompted the elevation of men with connections to past traditions. The writer of the Shepherd of Hermas complains that presbyters and local leaders quarreled constantly among themselves over issues of rank and authority. Charismatic prophets battled with church executives, if you will. However, there soon proved to be more priests than prophets in the early church. The function of bishops can be put down to this, presiding at church meetings, especially baptisms, at the celebration of the Eucharist, preaching and teaching, and in the administration of funds to the needy, and representing the church at these councils and gatherings. Now the idea of apostolic succession was advanced by Irenaeus 
and supported by writers like Cyprian, who developed the idea into magistrates who were making governmental and judicial decisions. So these bishops were men who were making decisions for the whole church under their administration. And this idea of apostolic succession, the connection to the past, and we have one very good example. We have Saint John the Apostle who taught Polycarp, who died around the year 156, who taught Irenaeus, who died in the year 202. And what Irenaeus is saying is I've got a connection right back to Jesus through John, through Polycarp, and then Irenaeus taught people this idea of apostolic succession, a connection to the early roots of the faith. Well, the authority of bishops became even greater after Constantine granted them judicial powers by incorporating them into the governing structure of the Roman Empire. And hence, in the third century, you could have Cyprian, a bishop in North Africa, say, if anyone is not with the bishop, such a one is not in the church. Well, some bishops had extraordinary power, especially those in Jerusalem, in Rome, in Antioch, in Alexandria, Caesarea, Constantinople, and Carthage, these main centers of Christianity. As time progressed, bishops had less and less liturgical function, less and less preaching and teaching roles, and they became more engaged in administration. Though Augustine was to comment, the bishop is a servant of the servants of the Lord, a phrase that would later become a papal title that popes would use in the Middle Ages. But by the fifth century, Leo I was insisting that there should be one bishop over all the other bishops. You can see this development towards the church hierarchy which will characterize the medieval church. Nicene Orthodoxy, the decisions handed down at Nicaea, became so rigid in the attempt to establish correct teaching that it wound up alienating its patron, Emperor Constantine himself, and as a result lost momentum. But in the end, however, diplomacy and official patronage ensured the triumph of orthodoxy. Well, stable definitions of orthodoxy and heresy were not developed in the early church. This took time. It took centuries, in fact, to define the faith completely. However, by the fifth century, I am prepared to say that Augustinian Christianity the form of Christianity closely associated with St. Augustine was ascendant in the West. That became orthodoxy. That became the correct teaching. By that time, I submit the church was defined and organized. The faith was framed. Correct teaching was established. But the casualties were many. By the time the church fathers retired from their council business, in the year 451, orthodoxy had achieved its maturity. The decisions at Nicaea, at Constantinople, at Ephesus, and at Chalcedon had served to create a distinction between right and wrong. The forceful and resounding Athanasian Creed was the final plank in the house of early church authority. To quote from that document, whoever will be saved must of necessity hold to this faith. The one that will be saved must think thus. It is necessary to everlasting salvation to adhere to this faith, which except each one believe faithfully they cannot be saved. So the wheel of the church rolls onward, crushing the dissenters and the heretics, and the blood of the martyrs became seed. There are other martyrs, seldom spoken of except in a dismissive sort of way. People like Origen and Nestorius and Sibelius, Didymus the Blind, are martyrs of orthodoxy. Not remembered such, but the wheel of the church rolls on 
This is the Christian faith, and unless you keep it, you will perish eternally. The church fathers took their stand upon this rock.